Hey everyone, this is Music Tech Help Guy, and welcome to part one of my Music Theory for Producers course. In this series, we're going to explore traditional and modern music theory, so notes, scales, rhythm, keys, clefs, chords, triads, seventh chords, the circle of fifths, how to build chord progressions from a key, how to create melodies within a key, how to create harmonies within a key, and a number of other topics. Bear with me for a moment so I can tell you a little bit about my background in music and explain to you how important it is and how important formal music theory was to my current job as a full-time audio engineer, producer, and a business owner. So the goal of this series is that you learn formal music theory so that you can apply it to your work, whether you're a songwriter, a producer, a mix engineer, a performer, or whatever. I was very fortunate to grow up playing guitar and piano as a kid, and you know I played in my high school band, and played in uh, bands in, in high school and college, and I went on to study music in college. I have both master's and bachelor's degrees in music, um, and I've studied music, performed music, and written music all my life. I've also taught college-level music theory classes in addition to teaching college-level audio classes. I got interested in writing my own music when I was only eight years old. I was just playing around in my grandmother's piano and a small keyboard that my parents bought me, uh, just toying around and coming up with my own ideas. Throughout high school and college, I played guitar and drums in a few bands, but I was studying formal music theory at the college, so I feel like I was lucky enough to get the best of both worlds. Learning music theory really, really helped me to write music, not just more music and uh, more efficiently, but better and more interesting music. Understanding theory makes coming up with chords and melodies second nature and makes you a more critical listener of your own work as well. And that way you can revise it later and make your music even better instead of just sticking with your first ideas. For me, it's a mix of ideas, melodies, and lyrics that just come out of me, blended with my formal theory knowledge to create a full song. I've worked with many, many great singers and songwriters over the years that come up with great music and they literally have no formal music knowledge just or just maybe just bare bones knowledge and they still come up with good music. But sometimes after you listen to a lot of their music, a lot of it sounds the same because they're only working within a small sliver of the tones and chords and melodies actually available to use because they lack that theory knowledge. So let me just say one more thing before we get into this. Bear with me through the first several parts of the series because for some, it may seem like we're moving at a snail's pace. However, when you get down the road, you may be asking me to split up some of the topics and slow down a bit. I've taught music theory to hundreds of college students over the last decade, and the number one reason why people fail at theory is because the fundamentals at first seem boring and mundane, and so some students kind of check out at that point. But when you get to a later lesson and you don't understand the fundamentals, and you haven't sort of memorized them uh, by heart, you'll be lost when we start talking about key signatures, building chords, chord inversions, scales, altering scales, seventh chords, etc. So just keep in mind as you work through, say, the first five or six parts of the series, um, just be, pay very close attention uh, because the fundamentals are very, very important. All right, so the, for our first lesson, the topics are pretty simple. Um, let's talk about the white keys on the piano identify what those are. Uh, we'll talk about clefs in written music, piano roll, and octaves. So the first thing we need to talk about is the note middle C, right there, C3. Um, middle C, if you have a MIDI keyboard in front of you, is the cent literally the centermost C on your MIDI keyboard. Um, if you have a piano at home, it is the centermost C on the piano. Um, it doesn't matter what size of keyboard you have either. The, mi the middle C is always going to be the centermost uh, C. Just make sure that your octave, um, your octave control is in the correct octave. Now, middle C has been given a lot of names over the years. Um, some DAWs refer to middle C as C4. Logic refers to it as C3. In traditional music, um, middle C is C4. Now, the way you can locate the Cs on the keyboard is it is the white key that is just to the left of the sets of two black keys. And you'll notice this sort of uh, pattern across the keyboard. You have two black keys, no black key, three black keys, no black key. And that pattern continues across the keyboard. Now, in the next video, we'll start talking about the black keys, but from now, we're just gonna talk about the white keys. So the names of our um, keys on the piano, starting on middle C, we have C, D, 
E, F, G, A, B, C. So we're just going, basically, uh, we're going in order, starting on C, and when we get to G, we start over from A. There's no such thing as a note for H or I. It just goes up, it's A through G, and then it restarts to A, unless you talk about German music, but that's a whole other that's a whole other issue, and that only really applies to traditional classical German music. Um, so yeah, we have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now, the reason why the C repeats itself is because these two notes, C3 and C4, and also C2 down here, are called octaves. Now, an octave is two notes that essentially sound similar. They sound very harmonious. They sound like they belong together. That they they sound very sonorous, um, and they sound they sound very similar. But they're they're actually two different frequencies. If we take this down to like a frequency level, um, so for instance, middle C is 261.63 hertz. Now, if you move up an octave to C4, your frequency doubles. So whatever 261.64 times two is. That is the frequency of C4. Perhaps an easier note to talk about frequency with is the note A. So we can count up C, D, E, F, G, A. This is A3. Um, and this note is A, it's often referred to as A440 because it's 440 hertz. So if we start on A and we go down to the next A down, the next octave down, now the frequency is 220 hertz as opposed to 440. Or if we go up an octave, it doubles. So instead of 440 hertz, it's 880 hertz. So that's fundamentally what an octave is. And harmony um, and different types of intervals, that's a, really the octave is our first type of interval between two notes. You know, we have seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths. We'll, we'll get into those in a later video, but the octave is sort of like our fundamental um, interval between two notes, the space between two notes. And it's also the basis for a lot of harmony. You'll see a lot of chords played this way, you know, where you have four notes and the top and bottom note are both octaves. Or when you play a scale like I just played earlier, the top and bottom note are the same, regardless of what note you start on. You know, if I start down here on D, and play a scale, you'll see that the scale starts and ends on D. So the octave is a fundamental interval that's used a lot in, in, um, in music. All right, so these numbers, these refer to, some people call them register numbers, I call them octave identification numbers. They're a way to know which register you're in, which octave you're in. Um, you can play chords here, you can play them up here, you can play them down here. All three of those that I played were a C major chord. Again, we'll get into chords later, but they were in three different registers or, or octaves. So the way you um, identify what the number, because the keyboard here is only identifying um, the Cs, you know. Um, if we move up to the D here, this is D3, E3, F3, G3, A3, B3, and then when you get to the next C, it switches to C4. So this is C4, D4, E4, F4, G4, A4, and if we scrolled up, we'd get to uh, B4, and then finally C5. Likewise, when you go down, this is C3, B2, A1, or not A1, A2, G2. So these all have a designation of two. So these are all designated two, these are all designated three, these are all designated four, and you can go all the way up, um, and you can go all the way down. You can get into the negative numbers, and you can get up into the the seventh and eighth uh, registers that, and octaves. So as an example, what I played, um, what I recorded in advance was just a C major scale um, in logic here, and I quantized everything to the grid. Let's just play that and see what it sounds like, and follow along with this thing down here, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So for now, don't pay so much attention to what these symbols mean. Just pay attention to where the little black note head is. Um, so this is our staff. The staff is the um, 
sort of the 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 way we convey what note is what note. Um, the very first note that I played was C three. It's called again middle C. So that's that note right there that we had played before, and middle C is written on this particular staff right here, one line below the staff. So when notes are written on the staff, they're written on the staff on lines and then spaces. So we, you can see we have a line, space, line, space, line, space, and so forth. And it alternates. As you get uh, too high above the staff or too low below the staff, you have to sort of extend the staff. And that's why this low C here has a line through it. That's called a ledger line. It extends the staff lower than it can normally go. Now in piano roll, which you guys are probably used to seeing this um, looking like, is something more like this. And this is one of the, the most important things about working with music theory for music production, um, is un having, having an understanding of both how to identify this on the staff, but also identify it in piano roll. You can see it's very easy uh, to see. It's basically the same thing as the piano that I had out earlier, just um, you know vertically. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, right? So that's easy. That's, that's, that's pretty easy to see because you can see what note you're on in piano roll. With staff, there's some tradition with staff, with staffs, with staves is the plural of staff. This little symbol over here, ignore the 4-4 four, four for now. That's the time signature or meter. We'll talk about meters uh, later. But this little symbol right here is called the clef. This particular clef is called the treble clef. Now, there's two main types of clefs. Um, there's treble clef and bass clef. If we switch this over to the bass clef, you'll see that the, the position of the notes changes. Let me just pull this up here and zoom in a bit. You'll see that the position of the notes changes, and also the symbol over here changes. Now, treble clef, uh, let me just pull up a little document here just so you can, so you can see this better. Because I want to show you the common clefs. There's a couple different types of clefs in addition to, to treble and um, bass clef. Here we go. So we had treble clef, we have bass clef. We've seen those two. Um, we'll talk about these other two in a moment, but treble clef essentially references, let me switch back over to treble here. Treble clef references the note G. So we said that the note G, let me just pull up my keyboard. We said the note G was here. And you count up C, D, E, F, G. The note G on the staff is also the fifth note up in the C major scale. One, two, three, four, five. This one right here. Notice that this little curly Q thing here wraps around the G line. That's how you can identify um, what note um, you're looking at in reference to treble clef. Now, what you should do is just memorize where the notes are on the staff, so you don't have to you don't have to always reference G. But Treble clef is, is often called the G clef for that reason, because it references that note G. Treble clef is used for instruments that are treble in range, so higher in range. So guitar uses it. Um, I know guitar can get kind of low, but we'll, we'll talk about the register of guitar later. But, you know, flute, clarinet, um, the right hand of piano, the left hand of piano is actually bass clef. And the bass clef is used for instruments that are obviously in the bass register. So things like bass guitar, orchestral bass, cello, um, the left hand of piano. Um, and you'll notice that the notes, again, shift up. Now, bass clef references um, a different um, note. Let me go into my piano roll editor here. And uh, let me, let's not do it that way, though. Hit command four. I'm going to hit command A to select all, and I'm going to hit shift option and down just to pull this whole thing down an octave. Because in bass clef, and ba you can see all those notes came down an octave. So now this is C, but instead of being C3, like we looked at before, because we pulled all the notes down an octave, this is now C2. So anyway, the note that bass clef references, if you look at these two dots on the bass clef, they are around the note F. So that is F in bass clef. B 
bass clef is often referred to as F clef. Now, you'll see like sort of the, um, you'll see sort of like a, um, a relationship between your treble and bass clef when you look at something that is called um, grand staff, treble and bass clef, but you can call it grand staff. Now, this has both clefs in it for one instrument. This is the way piano and keyboardists read music. A lot of other instruments that only play one note at a time that don't play chords don't, um, don't read grand staff like that. They would just read one clef. Let me play in a, a scale, a, a C major scale again, but I'm going to do it in two octaves. I'm going to play one scale up to middle C and then another scale up to the C above middle C. There we go. I'm just going to quantize those notes so they look nice on the staff. There we go. So this is C2. There's middle C, C3. And there's C4. Middle C is called middle C not only because it's sort of in the middle of the piano, but it's also the C that is directly in between the treble clef and the bass clef. If you take this note and you go down one more step, down to say B here. So if I pull this note down, notice that it jumps down, ignore the symbol on it for now, but notice it jumps down to the next clef. If I take this note, this B, and move up one more step up to C, it will move up to the treble clef staff. So essentially, middle C is one ledger line lower than treble clef, but also one ledger line higher than bass clef. It's right in between, directly in between treble clef and bass clef. Um, so that's another reason why it's referred to as middle C. All right, so that's the grand staff and the treble and bass clef. Pretty easy to understand. Just sort of um, commit to memory where notes are on the staff because it'll really help uh, in the future. Um, let's look at these other two clefs. And by the way, there's many, many different types of clefs. I just want to explain these two. Um, alto clef puts middle C right in the middle of the treble clef staff. So as opposed to being down here like it was for treble and up here like it was for bass, it's right in the middle of the staff. Alto clef is most commonly used for an instrument called viola. If you're not familiar with it in the orchestra, you have violins, that's the highest uh, string instrument, you have your violas, which is your sort of mid-range, mid-high instrument, then your cellos and your basses. Violas traditionally read alto clef. Tenor clef, uh, and that's really one of the only instruments or one of the, the few instruments that reads alto clef. Tenor clef is even more rare. Um, sometimes instruments like bassoons, it's like the big, tall, wooden um, instrument. Bassoons will sometimes read te tenor clef. Sometimes euphoniums and baritones will read tenor clef, but not often. Um, I'm not really good. We're not going to use these two at all because you're not going to see them in in modern music. You're only really going to see treble clef and bass clef. And so there's a couple octave uh, transposing variations of these two that we'll we'll get into later. So those are the different types of 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 clefs. Um, another diagram that might be helpful here is this. And it's sort of it's similar to what we just uh, looked at. It shows all of the notes on the piano, all the white keys in the piano and where their location is on the staff. And note, note that when we get higher than the staff can go, you start writing ledger lines. Just like when you go lower than the staff can go, you start writing ledger lines, and you can keep going. There's instruments like flute and piccolo that go way higher than the treble clef staff, and there's notes on tuba that go way lower than the bass clef staff. So um, this is sort of like a, a, a chunk, like almost the full gamut, Not well, not even really the full gamut, like a chunk of the full gamut the full range of uh, notes that you can have on the staff. But again, uh, with the octave identification, look at it this way. This is C3. This is C4. This would be C5. You can go up another octave to C6. This is C2. And this is C1. So those are just the white keys on the piano and on treble clef and bass clef. In the next video, we will move on to the black keys and talk about accidentals and enharmonic notes. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.